There are Second Amendment challenges to gun control laws all over America right now. We know this. I want to talk, though, about one of the challenges brought by gun owners of America in the state of New York against a bunch of the new gun control laws that have been enacted there just recently in light of the Bruin decision by the Supreme Court. I specifically want to focus in on a couple of the historical analogous laws that New York is trying to use against our right to keep and bear arms and how absurd, in my view, these analogies really are. But I want you to understand why that's the case in just one moment. Hey folks, I'm Mark Smith, host of the Four Boxes Diner, proud American gun owner, constitutional attorney, best-selling author, and member of the U.S. Supreme Court Bar. If you haven't subscribed to the Four Boxes Diner Second Amendment channel, please do so and show your love for the right to keep in your arms. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter. Yes, I have joined Twitter to spread the word farther and wider than ever before, I hope. Okay, folks. I want to focus in on some of the anti-gun arguments that are being made by places like the state of New York in trying to justify their new gun laws that they passed trying to thwart the Supreme Court's decision in NYSERPA versus Bruin. And I just want to point out a couple of these to show you how they're absurd so you understand the historical basis for what I'm about to say. In New York State, Gun Owners of America has brought a lawsuit in the Northern District of New York challenging some of these new gun control laws. New York State has argued that these gun control laws that they've enacted, in particular those that allow the state to assess the moral um, aptitude, if you will, the moral fitness, uh, the personality traits, the character of the applicant who wants to carry guns outside the home for to protect himself from criminals and other purposes of self-defense, that they're allowed to investigate the moral character of the applicants for these pistol permits. And to justify this, New York State is relying on a series of laws from before the American Revolution and during the American Revolution to say that this allows them to do so. Three of those laws are as follows. They talk about laws that ban the trading of firearms with the Native American population, the Indians, so really banning guns uh, from the Tories back in the founding period or denying the ability to sell guns to the Indians is no different than in World War II saying you couldn't sell guns to the Germans, uh, you couldn't sell guns to the Japanese in the middle of World War II because you're at war with them. And likewise, it'd be like saying you can't sell guns to the Iranians today or you can't sell guns to the Russians today because, you know, basically they're viewed as enemies. So again, uh, any precedents involving denying Tories access to firearms or the Indians access to firearms it has nothing to do with domestic gun control has has nothing to do with uh, gun policy that's all about you know foreign wars and denying people that are fighting against you uh, in an actual war the ability to have firearms uh, that has nothing again to do with domestic uh, laws or domestic gun control now in terms of the catholics this is a little bit more interesting uh, but it doesn't fly here as well i wanted to step back and remind you all where our second amendment comes from we know we have a right to keep and bear arms as confirmed, remember the Second Amendment doesn't create a right to keep and bear arms. It recognizes a pre-existing right to keep and bear arms. So where exactly does the pre-existing right to keep and bear arms in American law come from? Well, it comes from many philosophical and other sources, but most specifically it comes from an English law called the English Declaration of Rights that arose in the year 1689. And what was this about? Before the year 1689, you had... Uh, someone who was considered kind of a, a, a rabid uh, Catholic king named James II. He really disliked Protestants. He tried to disarm Protestants. He did a lot of bad things to the Protestants in England. And that gave rise to what was known as the Glorious Revolution. During the Glorious Revolution, King James II, the Catholic, was deposed. He basically stepped down and he was replaced by... Uh, William and Mary, William was, it was William of Orange from the Netherlands, but bottom line is that William and Mary became the new king and queen, if you will, of England with the support of Parliament, and they were Protestants. And one of the things that occurred when the Protestants got into power is they enacted the Declaration of Rights that preserved the rights of Englishmen. One of those rights was the right to keep and bear arms. But of course, they had just been in a bloody fight with the Catholics and the King James II, a Catholic himself. And what they decided to do when the Protestants got into power with William and Mary in the Parliament, they specifically said that 
the Catholics did not have the same rights to keep and bear arms or other rights as the Protestants. Remember, these religious wars that went on throughout kind of the hundreds of years before our American founding were a major reason why we in the United States have a Bill of Rights that includes the First Amendment that says you shall not establish a formal religion here in the United States. That's why we don't have a national religion of Catholicism or Protestantism or Judaism or what have you, because our founding fathers wanted to keep us out of religious strife of the sort that we saw in England between the Catholics and the Protestants. And again, that's a big part. So here you have in New York, the anti-gunners are citing to the English Declaration of Rights showing that, that yes, indeed, there was a long-standing uh, history of discriminating against Catholics who were viewed as someone that you couldn't trust with firearms. But again, this, as the Supreme Court said in the Heller case in 2008, although we get our rights from the English Declaration of Rights to some degree, we did not just copy it and embrace it. So again, while the Second Amendment derives uh, in large part from the English Declaration of Rights from 1689, it did not just cut and paste it. Basically, if you look at what James Madison wrote at the time, he said that there was flaws with the English Declaration of Right, one of rights, one of which is it was created by Parliament and thus could be repealed by Parliament. They didn't want that to occur, which is why we put our right to keep and bear arms in a Bill of Rights that could not be repealed by Congress. It actually would have to be amended through a constitutional amendment, which is much more difficult to do than to pass a law. And second of all, Madison, of course, notes that. Uh, well, you know, the, the Declaration of Rights discriminated against Catholics, and therefore in the Second Amendment, it has used, guess what language is used? In the Second Amendment, it says the right of the people, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Madison wrote the people in the Second Amendment and other parts of the Bill of Rights because he wanted to make it clear that unlike the English ancestors um, who distinguished between Protestants and Catholics in terms of certain rights under the English right and um, under the English Declaration of Rights. He did not want that distinction to be made in our Constitution, and therefore he talked about the people in many contexts, including but not limited to the Second Amendment's right to keep and bear arms for the people. So to wrap up, the point is that New York is using laws that basically prevented the Tories, who were the anti-American revolutionaries, from having guns. Again, we were at war with them, so it made sense to deny them guns, not domestic gun control. Likewise, to the extent we restricted the sale of firearms to the Indians uh, during the pre-revolutionary period, again, by and large, we were in many instances at war with the Indians. The Indians were fighting for the uh, British uh, in many instances. So we, you know, and again, remember the French Indian War where George Washington became kind of an initial military genius, if you will, um, before the American Revolution, you know, it was called the French Indian War for a reason, because again, there was a lot of fights involving the Indians. So not being allowed to sell guns to the Indians was really analogous to, again, in World War II, not being allowed to sell guns to the Japanese or Germans because we were at war with them. That's kind of how wars work, but it has nothing to do with domestic gun control. And last but not least, you know, any attempt to uh, use the historical discrimination against Catholics under the English Bill of Rights of 1689 doesn't fly because James Madison himself recognized that distinction and did away with it, not just with the First Amendment that says you cannot establish a religion and that everyone has a free exercise of religion in the United States, showing that we're not going to discriminate on the basis of religion here in the United States in contrast to the British. Uh, he also points out that he Madison used the words the people in the Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms, the, pe the right of the people to keep and bear arms, making it, make it clear we're talking about all of the people of all religious stripes and not just Protestants versus Catholics. So again, these are some of the arguments you're going to hear from the anti-gunners trying to desperately find uh, historical examples of gun control from 1791, the time of the Second Amendment's ratification. It's going to be extremely difficult for them to do this. I'm sure their lawyers are working hard and this is the best they came up with. And if this is the best the anti-gunners got, they have to use it. But at the end of the day, I don't think it's going to fly because the right to keep and bear arms is a fundamental right and it should not be infringed upon uh, in these types of cases or in these instances that we're seeing in places like New York and California. Okay, I hope you learned something here today at the Four Boxes Diner. If you haven't subscribed, please do so. We'll see you again soon here at the Four Boxes Diner. Order's up. Table 2A.